a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. Several weeks ago, I took a brief holiday and went with my family for a week into the interior of South Africa, into the region known as the Karoo. The Karoo is a very arid geographical region. Its name is derived from the Khoisan word meaning land of thirst. We did a large circular trip, starting off in Sutherland, which has the distinction of being one of the coldest towns in South Africa and is frequently blanketed in snow during the winter months. Sutherland also hosts the telescopes of the South African Astronomical Observatory, which includes the South African Large Telescope, which is the largest single optical telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. We ended up in Lanesburg, a small Karoo town, and although being in one of the driest parts of South Africa, experienced a freak flood that devastated the town on the 25th of January 1981, claiming 104 lives. On our return, when we passed the turn-off to Sutherland, just outside the tiny village and railway station of Mikey's Fontaine, my wife commented, Now we have come full circle and have ended up where we began a week ago. At that very moment, I was reminded of what I had said in episode 39 of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. I said in the book of Revelation that there are three series of seven events that focus on the last seven years of human history. The first series was the opening of the seven seals. The second series was the seven trumpets that sounded, and finally, the seven bowls of wrath that will be poured out upon the earth. Each of these series of sevens ends with the same sights and sounds, namely flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. In episode 40, we ended with Revelation 11 verses 19, which closed this particular loop of the sounding of the seven trumpets, and we are returning again to the beginning of the last seven years of history, to concentrate on some fascinating characters and personalities that appear. These characters include a dragon, a woman, and her son. They appear in Revelation 12 verses 1 to 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down the third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. There is a lot of rich and powerful symbolism in this passage, and we have to interpret the symbols correctly to understand the reality behind them. What do these symbols mean, and whom do they symbolize? Two of these three symbols that appear in these verses are quite easy to identify. The dragon is the easiest to identify. In verse 9, just a few verses on, we are told exactly who this dragon is. This is the devil, appearing as a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. The numbers mentioned here are significant as well. Seven, as we know, is God's number, the perfect number, but within the context of the great dragon, it simply signifies evil behind the mask of a false religion and a false god. The heads of the dragon symbolize intellect, but human intellect. The crowns symbolize spiritual authority and power vested in an individual. In this case, it is a man and his intelligence with authority and power ruling in the place of the true God. The number 10 is also significant, and horns are also a symbol of power. So the 10 horns are a kingdom of 10 nations that form the power base of the dragon. This is the resurrected Roman Empire, but we will speak more about that later. We are also told in verse 9 that he is the ancient serpent, the very same one who appeared in the Garden of Eden to Eve and deceived her and the man and brought sin into the human race. 
he appears here as a dragon, which is simply another form of a serpent and the symbol of satanic or man-centered worship that is present in many parts of the world even today. His work is also described in verse 9. The entire work of the devil is to deceive and to lie to the whole human race. The male child that is born to the woman mentioned in this passage is also very easy to identify. In verse 5, we are told that he is the one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Hopefully, some of you will recognize that that phrase is taken directly from Psalm 2. This psalm speaks of God establishing his kingdom on his holy hill of Zion. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall rule them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So clearly this has to be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. The reference to the rod of iron always refers to the millennial thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Christ will reign with a rod of iron because, though it will be a time of worldwide blessing and prosperity, it will also be a time when sin is still manifest to some degree. Righteousness reigns in the earth, but it has to be enforced. Only when we come to the new heavens and the new earth, in the final two chapters of Revelation, will Jesus no longer reign with the rod of iron. Sin will have been fully dealt with, and nothing evil will be allowed to enter that scene at all. Then Jesus will appear as a tender, loving shepherd, ministering to his people personally and showing great loving kindness to them all. This brings us finally to the identity of the woman. Who is this strange woman who appears clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and twelve stars in a crown around her head? The Roman Catholic Church will say that it is Mary because she was the mother of Jesus, as this passage shows the symbolic woman to be. The problem with that theory is that there is no way you can fit Mary into verse 6. There we learn that the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which he is to be nourished for 1,260 days. This never happened to Mary, and it never will. This is not a picture of an individual, but rather a group of people. Some commentators insist that this woman symbolizes the church. They think that the church is pictured at the close of Revelation as the bride of Christ, in other words, as a woman. But it is impossible for this symbolic woman to represent the church because the church did not give birth to Jesus, but Jesus who produced the church born out of his wounds. Therefore, that symbolism does not fit into the picture here. Therefore, we must look elsewhere for the clues to discover the identity of this woman. We read that she is clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet and a crown of twelve stars is around her head. The only other place where these three symbols are used together in this way is in Genesis 37, in the story of one of Joseph's dreams that he had as a young boy. He dreamt one night that the sun, the moon, and eleven stars came and bowed down before him. His mother, father, and brothers were very upset by this when he made the mistake of telling them his dream. His father, Jacob, correctly interpreted Joseph's dream to mean that Joseph was to be exalted somehow and the whole family would come and bow down before him. We know later from Joseph's story in Genesis that this actually did happen. Joseph was made a ruler in Egypt, second only to the king, and his father and mother and his eleven brothers all came and bowed down before him. So the symbol of this woman is clearly a description of the nation of Israel with Joseph being the twelfth star. In Romans 9 verses 5, Paul speaks of the Jews as belonging to the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. So it was Israel that in a human sense brought forth the Christ. Jesus did tell the woman at the well of Samaria in John 4 verses 22 that, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. So the woman here is Israel, brought into prominence again. 
The best way to understand and interpret this chapter is to remember that we are being shown scenes on earth from heaven's point of view. In chapter 4, John was caught up to heaven and shown all the scenes that follow from chapters 4 through to 19. When you look at earthly events from heaven's viewpoint, time is never a component. It is not a question of sequence or chronology, but simply of occurrence. In chapter 4, it is what happens, not when it happens. If we remember that, this chapter will make a lot more sense. Along with the woman and her son is the great red dragon, watching Israel intently and ready to devour her long-promised son when he makes his appearance on earth. This actually takes us back to the birth of Jesus, during the days of the Roman Empire when Israel was ruled by King Herod the Great. Herod attempted to kill the newborn son of God by slaughtering all the infants of Bethlehem. But we know from the gospel records that God intervened and spared the infant Jesus from the mouth of the dragon, Herod. Warmed by the appearance of an angel in a dream, Joseph and Mary took Jesus on a secret journey to Egypt beyond the reach of Herod. So you can see the events of that time symbolized here for us in verses 2 to 4. We are told that the dragon swept a third of the stars from the sky with his tail. Now we have already seen in Revelation that stars, used symbolically, are pictures of prominent leaders among men, specifically here among Israel. Now in Isaiah 9 verses 15, the prophet says specifically, the prophet who teaches lies is the tail. The stars symbolize the leaders of Israel who are deceived by their own teachers and prophets who fall from their moral position before God. The dragon, in the form of the Roman Empire, waits to destroy the son through Herod the Great when the child is born. We know how God prevented that from happening when Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt and so protected Jesus from Herod. It says in verse 5 that the child was caught up to God and to his throne. The symbolism changes from the birth of Jesus to his ascension 30 years later and skips over the whole of his life and his ministry his death and his resurrection. But there is a deep truth hidden here that you might just miss. Jesus found deliverance from danger by being caught up to God and his throne. This also speaks of the final destiny of the church. All through the New Testament, the church and the Lord are regarded as one. In Acts 9 verses 4, when Saul was converted on the Damascus road, Jesus appeared and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul was actually persecuting the church, but Jesus said, Why are you persecuting me? In 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12, Paul writes that the body of Christ is one, and adds in the second half of verse 12 that, So it is with Christ. The church and the Lord Jesus are together the body of Christ. So hidden here amongst the symbols of the great red dragon, the woman and her son, is an account of the whole history of the church, including the rapture. It is interesting that the Greek word used here for the child that was caught up to God. The Greek word for caught is the word herpaste. This is the same term that is used for the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. This event occurs before the dragon, or Satan, begins his persecution. Verse 6 carries us forward to this time. The woman, we are told, flees into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. This places this event at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. 1,260 days is 42 months, or three and a half years. I'm sure you remember that number from earlier podcasts. At this point, what we must all understand is that Satan is taking out his wrath on Israel and Christians because he cannot get to his true prey, the male child, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. If he cannot attack Jesus directly, he will try instead to defeat Jesus' plan and purpose. He does this by blinding the eyes of this world to the truth. He does this by turning the world against both Jew and Christian. He is attempting to destroy the witness of God in this world. This is David Wiles, 
your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 41. Thank you.